could just record this whole uh, session and I can post this up someplace as a link. So anyone that, that misses it can just review it. So, okay. Uh, so who wants to do their listening thing first? I'm sure. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. So what do you have, Christy? Um, mine is just a, a cool version of uh, Claire de Lune and they call it, a, they called it a modular reflection. Oh, okay. Let me, let me pull that up here. You can kind of skip through parts too, because it doesn't get cool until like midway through. <laughs> okay. I'm downloading it here. Here's the link. One second. And here, let me, uh, I can share this screen and I've got to make sure I'm sharing the computer sound okay can't beat Claire de Lune. Um, uh, so uh, do you know like the some of the history of, of the, the synth versions of, of classical things? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, Wendy Carlos, know that name? Anybody? No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Wendy Carlos was sort of early in the synthesis um, thing, probably in the 70s, and came up with the uh, like this first big you know, crossover breakout uh, project for synths called uh, Switched On Bach. And um, so she just reimagined all of these famous Bach pieces, but realized them on, uh, uh, on, well, I guess it was mainly Moog synthesizers at the time. 
So it was, uh, the, you know, the public had never heard anything like that before, became a big bestseller, and then um, uh, sort of put Carlos in the, in the fast track, uh, and she scored some uh, films. Uh, I'm trying to think of which, which films. Um, uh, uh, was it Blade Runner? Possibly. So, but, but anyway, uh, so the idea of taking something classical and then reimagining it on synths, it goes back quite a ways. One of my favorite um, uh, versions of that was Bob James did a, uh, did a whole, uh, let's see, it was uh, uh, it wasn't Rameau, he did a, uh, but he, he did a whole Baroque album with synths, but it was just very tasteful, tastefully done. So it wasn't just, you know, for the, uh, you know, the shock value, he actually made it just super musical and lovely. So yeah, great, uh, yeah, great example. Uh, okay, who's next? I can go next. Okay, and let me get back. So am I sending the link to you? Um, yeah, or you can just uh, go to the Moodle page and post it there. Oh yeah, uh, hold on. So it should be the March 30 listening excerpts. Yep. I just got to get the URL copied real quick. Okay. My laptop's kind of old, so it moves real slow when Zoom is on, but I'm getting there. Well, why don't we do look at Jake's post while you're getting that posted? That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. So here, copy. I'm going to just put this in a new new window.
nightmare to do. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the problem was that it's a highly syncopated song and therefore everyone was sort of interpreting all those syncopations differently and there's the big tempo change in it and none of those lined up. So uh, here's what I was dealing with. <laughs> so uh, for instance, uh, like right here, that's the big tempo change. Each one of those is a cut where I was aligning syllables through there. And uh, well, you know, it's reasonable. I mean, it's still not perfect. But uh, uh, the, the other problem, it was um, most of those were just phone mics and Phone mics are not really very good. So uh, the, uh, if I solo any one of these at the end, most of these were going into heavy distortion. So let me, let me solo one of these. And that, that's all my uh, programming of volumes. You can see crossfades that I was doing. So it was, yeah, let's see, let me just play. Yeah, Jillian here. Yeah. Ah, that was terrible. <laughs> so I had all the, to try and EQ around distortion and, uh, uh, yeah, uh, compress, compress things appropriately, trying to make everything sound like it was like a real choir singing. How do um, you EQ around distortion? Well, uh, here, let me, let me show you. I, that, one, that one I couldn't do much with, but um, here, let me just show you my EQ curves I did on people. Um, like, uh, uh, let's see that one. Uh, yeah, but yeah, that, that was one of my EQ curves where I high pass filtered this, get off all the low end. Uh, actually, let me get a better one where I, uh, here's one of the vocalists, where I uh, high pass filtered, cut off all the low rumble. Then I uh, low pass filtered to get all the, the my yucky high stuff off. And uh, let's see. If I let me play something back, if I can. Ah, that one. Uh, sorry, I. I'm used to having two uh, two windows open. Come on. Oh, I was not, oh, there's nothing there. Uh, but, yeah, but well, let me find Jillian and show you where, where is she out there? I'll turn on the analyzer. Yeah, so you look at all of that. Uh, 
you know, I got off all this low stuff. And uh, basically, I lowered her volume just so that she wasn't in the mix very much. And it wasn't egregious when you heard her with everything else. So uh, if you listen to any one of these tracks as a solo track, it sounds terrible. But when you stack them all together, then it, it gets a lot better. A couple of them had um, nice mics, and, and I really emphasized the, this, the uh, singers that had the best microphones and sort of blended everything else out. And I, I did all this panning so I could spread all the singers out around different areas and made it sound sort of enveloping. I put the instrumental stuff, uh, uh, like the guitars, I had a couple electric guitar things here and I panned, hard panned right and left so that the guitars were out of the way of the chorus and just hard left and right. Um, I played in all the cymbal parts myself. Uh, I did, uh, yeah. well, I mean, the, the bass I played just, uh, you know, against the track. So, so anyway, it was, it was an involved production. I, I spent about 30 hours on this. So, wow. yeah, yeah. But uh, people seem to love it and that's, that's cool. So as long as, uh, you know, my bosses like it, I'm okay. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. Um, let's go back, see who's next. Um, let's see. Um, yeah. Anna. Yeah, mine's pretty fun this week. Okay. Here we go. To fly a rocket ship, you need to be an optimist. No astronaut launches from just seems so difficult. I don't know how long they sat there learning how to do that. <laughs> that's, I literally, that's... I was like, you could not make, you know, you could not make that B section more nauseating to play. And then I saw this. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I was like, no way. You know, that uh, it would take me forever to learn just the piano part on that. Yeah. And then to try and play it with, I mean, just the muscle memory that goes into learning where those sounds are in a not logical layout is crazy. I feel like it would mess up how you write music from like forever after that. <laughs> I think so. You have to like cross over your fingers in a way that it's just not oh. like possible. <laughs> that's that's yeah, like player piano. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, I guess when we have lots of time on our hands, we do crazy things. <laughs> yeah, you know. Do it, you know. There's nothing to do right now, but you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. What did you guys do during lockdown? I learned how to play music on four calculators. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly, exactly. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome, actually. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I see yours, Madison. Here, let's. Yeah, I finally got mine to post. Okay. So I think. Uh, because of the amount of stuff I've posted that has some sort of relevance to video games, everyone's pretty aware that I'm kind of a nerd now. 
but it's not about the video games for this one. It's the way these guys play the guitar. I think it's really, really cool. Uh, the guy on the left, I can't even follow his hand. Oh, let me get this into the sharing screen. So many uh, excellent musicians out there that uh, that actually make a pretty good living um, busking, as it's called, um, and just you know street musicians that that are really talented. And the thing is, they you know they play all day long, so you know they have those hours of of working where they get their techniques you know perfected by you know just doing it. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. I, my, uh, my screen recording was somewhat like lagging behind, but if any of you guys watch this at a future date, and I don't know if yours was or not, just the guy on the left in the blue shirt, the way his hand moves when he's strumming the guitar at some of those points, I can't follow what he's doing at all. Cause like, he looks like he's strumming with his hand, but plucking up with his fingers at the same time. And then also hitting the guitar for the kick drum, all three things at the same time. And I don't know how he's doing. I noticed that. You what? Uh, I noticed that. Yeah, I, I can't even tell how he's strumming the guitar. It just amazes me. Yeah, uh, the uh, frame rate for video is 30 frames per second, which means he's going faster than his motion. That man is running at 120 frames per second, at least with his hand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> that's, that's crazy.
<laughs> uh, yeah, awesome. Well, very cool. Um, so let's uh, here let's let's move ahead with what's on on the docket for uh, the day. Um, uh, yeah, Christina, I did see you. You've loaded up your uh, uh, your other your second project. So you're yeah. done already, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me uh, let me bring that up. I'm gonna hide this. And this is this is your project. Why don't you tell us about uh, about what you did here? Um, yeah, so I made a cover of a Rise Against song, Swing Life Away. And usually it's more like rocky and I like to make like chill acoustic covers. And so I just did a lead vocal. Uh, I played it on guitar, finger picking, and then I did a couple um, backing vocal tracks. Cool. Let's, let's take a listen here. That's that's beautiful. That was pretty sweet. I'm a big Rise Against fanboy. That was really sweet. Thank that's, you. Yeah, that that's really awesome. So, uh, um, there, uh, what uh, what kind of speakers did you use to mix on, or did you use your headphones? Um, I used a combination. I started off on my headphones, and then I switched over to my boyfriend's, who has a different sound, and then. I did it on a computer, uh, just like out loud, and then I did it on like uh, just bigger speakers. Ah, okay, yeah, that's <laughs> uh, it's really smart to listen because you get a different perspective on every single system you uh, you play it on. Uh, now, on my studio monitors here, 
the uh, the uh, low G on the guitar is really boomy. Yeah, I tried to take I tried to do do a high pass filter on some of the guitar and it seemed to get it on most of the systems that I listened to but yeah if if it, like the loudest speakers that I had that had more bass it didn't quite get all of it yeah yeah and it's it's funny the uh, your low e was fine it was the g hmm. the g note that was like popping out a little bit yeah and i even did try to um do like the the very narrow uh, section of EQ and try to take that out, but yeah, I guess that didn't help. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I, and it's you know it's not necessarily your fault that um, that your guitar that low G is just a resonant frequency on your guitar, and it'll always sound loud. It's interesting. Different instruments have their own resonant frequencies like every instrument uh, is sort of uh, idiosyncratic that way. A lot of cellos have uh, what they call, cellists call it a wolf tone, where it's the, I think on a cello, it's the C sharp is generally their wolf tone because it, it sort of howls. <laughs> and, uh, and so you have to use some pretty sophisticated EQ to try and minimize that. Um, I mean, it's, the guitar sounds really great. It's just that one note sort of jumps out in your mix. Um, I love your concept for the backing vocals where it's, it's just sort of ethereal angel-like <laughs> um, <laughs> backgrounds. And uh, I mean, the whole thing just sounds beautiful. So, Thank you. Really nice. Very nice. Um, okay. Uh, Anyone else making progress or thinking about at least the uh, final project recording? No. I've been working on all of them at once. But, uh, say it again, Madison. I've been working on them all at once, to be honest with you. <laughs> okay. I'm hopping back and forth so I don't get too like focused on one track. It keeps me a little bit open-minded for them. So it's been actually kind of helpful. You know, that, that is, a, I find that a very helpful thing it, to sort of clear your brain. And uh, uh, the tendency that I have is if I'm focusing on one thing, I start focusing on the weaknesses of that one thing. And I sort of ignore lots of other things that I shouldn't be ignoring. So, yeah. uh, so clearing your ears is a wonderful technique and uh, getting some space uh, going there. So, uh, uh, so, so Anna, I see you saying that you've got something going. What's, what are you doing? Well, cause I know originally before all hell broke loose, I had wanted to do some stuff with some string players I knew. However, because we can't like actually get together, yeah. that kind of had to scrap. But I've been trying to think about how maybe, maybe I could do, I could do some of my own recordings, but I could also do some sample libraries or something, you know, cause I, mm -hmm. I want to go big or go home, you know. <laughs> feel like it um but yeah I've been trying to figure out how to convert like what I was originally going to do and still like have my own portions like still have parts that are recorded by me if that makes sense yeah yeah and that would be a I think a great uh thing if uh, just come up with four original recording tracks as part of the overall soundscape that you come up with um your um, your choir samples are really lovely. I, I. Well, here's the funny thing: the one that I had sent you that's a that's a Logic. Um, Serious? <laughs> yes. The yeah, it's a real because it was really interesting when I came upon it. I was like, you know, this sounds better than the original, and it was um, it was like the African singer, and it had like the syllables, or whatever, and I was like it's a much better quality than the other ones. So that's why I ended up using it. And it's like, it ended up working out really nice. But yeah, those were, those were logic. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I've got some stuff for East and West that I can use or that I've been using a little bit. Um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. Sometimes you find those gems in the logic sample packs that are, are really usable. And, and I, I use them on all sorts of things. So. 
Mm-hmm. Very cool. So Jake, what's, what's up with you? What are your thoughts? Yo, Jake. I think we lost Jake. Oh no, it's too early for Jake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the, if you uh, look at uh, where we're supposed to be today, uh, it's on, um, uh, at least on the uh, Moodle page, it's talking about mastering. And so I uploaded a document here. And let me open that up. And uh, it's actually sort of a collection of, of articles on mastering. There is also in uh, our book, the, it's uh, chapter, uh, chapter 20 in, in our uh, normal uh, modern recording techniques is a great chapter on mastering. The, uh, I, I want you to read actually the articles plus the chapter in the book, chapter 20 because that gives you the, I think the broadest overview. The uh, book is going on, uh, I guess, uh, what, are, what are your best options for mastering? The recommendation is always that it's better to have someone else who's a professional master your project if you can afford it. And that's because uh, right off the bat, uh, he says that mastering is an art. And I totally subscribe to that theory that there are people who are mastering artists that can make your song better than you could imagine it being yourself. Uh, generally, mastering houses spend uh, ungodly amounts of money creating the perfect listening environment uh, architecturally, so the rooms are highly designed, uh, uh, all sorts of uh, sonic treatment to make them absolutely neutral. And then they install, and then they install hundreds and of thousands of dollars of mastering gear, usually a lot of analog processors to sort of the uh, uh, top end processors, uh, compressors, the uh, LA-2As and uh, um, uh, pool tech EQs that are, you know, five to $10,000 per pop. And they have banks of these. Um, so if you have, uh, have the money and you're going to put out a project, taking it to a reputable mastering house is highly recommended. Um, the, it's actually not that expensive. Uh, there are a lot of houses that will do it on a per track basis. So uh, I know one of the, the big houses in New York will, will master your project for $100 per track. So if you, not terrible. Yeah, if, if you think about that, you know, if you're trying to uh, break, have a breakout album, something that sounds better than everybody else is doing at home, a hundred dollars a track is not unreasonable and they will take it to a place that you can't take it to yourself. So uh, if you've got the budget, uh, there are a couple things that you need to do uh, if you want to have someone else master it. First of all, they will have some pretty tight parameters of what they want to get from you as a mastering house. So, uh, first off, they will want your best mix at the highest sample rate that you can provide it at the highest bit rate that you can provide it. So uh, uh, if you've recorded 96 kilohertz and uh, 32 bits, they will want that version of your mix. Uh, a lot of times they will, they'll also tell you do not use any master bus compression for your project. So, uh, so if you put a compressor on your master output, they'll say, turn that off, give me the mix without any compression on it because we want to have control of all of those parameters. Uh, many times they will also, um, also ask you for individual stems. So, uh, so a stem would be, for instance, uh, 
the drum tracks. You know, if you've got uh, uh, four or six or eight drum tracks, they'll want you, they'll want that master mix of just the drums as an isolated stereo mix. And they'll, uh, the main one that they'll want would be the lead vocals. So if you supply them just the vocal as a separate, totally isolated part, they'll like that. You know, they might have uh, guitar stems, background vocal stems. If they have all those available, if they're in the mastering process, there's some weakness in your mix, they can go back to the stems and uh, use that as an element to uh, come up with whatever correction that they want, whether it's uh, EQ or compression. And uh, it's almost they do a uh, like a sub mix. And um, that gives them the most, uh, I guess, the most flexibility in what they want to do. Um, so that being said, uh, most of us can't afford our own uh, to, to go to a big mastering house for our projects. And college I, budget. What's that? The college budget. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I, I will admit that I've never sent any of my projects out for mastering. And uh, well, for, for a number of reasons, not necessarily monetary, but I, uh, uh, most of my projects, I've known exactly what I wanted to come up with as the final project. And I do all the, uh, uh, you know, listening tests. I send it out to all sorts of people, get their take so I can touch it up myself. And, and I also have some, some pretty nifty tools and I've got pretty, uh, uh, you know, a pretty nice neutral room. So I, I, I'm pretty confident of what I'm coming out with. Um, if I had the opportunity for a future project, something that was gonna be a big national release, I wouldn't hesitate to, uh, to go with a mastering house. But that being said, I would do a lot of research on who is doing the mastering. Uh, I'd wanna make sure that they've mastered the kind of project that I'm giving them. So I wouldn't send a, uh, like a classical orchestral soundtrack to a guy that does rock all the time. They wouldn't get it. And they would, they would ruin the project. So, so you have to know who you're sending the project to, that they're the right person for that type of music that you're, you're producing. So, so after that, now everything else uh, applies here. It's uh, this do-it-yourself mastering. That's, uh, that's what most of us are gonna do. So this gives you a lot of things to think about of what is a master. Um, uh, so uh, uh, saying things like, uh, uh, does your mix lack punch, you know? Is that what you're after? Do you need that? Um, does, do all the tracks seem consistent? If you listen through the project start to end, does everything seem to flow right? Are there uh, variations of pace? Do the keys make sense going from the key of one song into the key of another song? How much space is there between the tracks? Does that feel right? Does it feel like, oh, wait, there's too big of a gap between these tracks? That's all uh, something that happens in mastering. They, um, a lot of times they'll use things uh, called, well, it's master bus compression, where all the levels will seem totally consistent from start to end, where there are variations in loud to soft, but they make sense if you listen to it as a, as a whole flow of an album. So uh, those are all things that mastering engineers uh, work on all the time. And you have to, you have to know what you're doing. So, um, uh, so this uh, consistent spectral balance. You know, if, if you play two different songs from your album, does it sound like it's from the same album? <laughs> and that's, that's really an important consideration. So uh, uh, that's, that's the kind of thing that you need to uh, think about. Um, 
And let's see. Yeah, I mean, you know, read the whole article. This talks about some software things that, um, uh, and I should show you, let me show you what I use. Uh, let me close this. Okay, so here's, uh, here's what I'm using as uh, my mastering tools. It's called Ozone. Um, Ozone is really good. It, um, uh, well, let me show you uh, what it does. It has all sorts of integrated tools. It's uh, EQ and compression. And so if I play this, you can sort of see what's happening here. Here's a compressor. It's got a limiter. It's got a compressor and then several bands of equalization. So uh, these are areas of uh, where you can apply compression to just a single band of frequencies, which is what these mastering engineers are really good at, is where do I need compression to bring out certain details in the mix? So Ozone has all of these tools and they've got collections of tools and you can sort of switch between um, you know, genres of music and come up with the one that that fits as, as a starting point. And then you can play with all of the, uh, the initial or the uh, individual settings here. Uh, you can play with the ratio, uh, you know, the, the attack release. Um, yeah, so Ozone, if you can afford it, it's not, it's not a cheap package, but it does a ton of things that bring your project up to that next level and you can get really close to what mastering engineers do if you can listen on a really good system and know what you're hearing. So that's, that's the caveat in all of this is uh, you can only get to that level of professionalism that your, the weakest part of your system has in it. And for most of us, that frankly is our monitors. So uh, if you have really good monitors you can get really good results. The rest of our systems are really pretty good. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, so, so anyway, uh, ozone is wonderful. And let me just show you, it's got all of these uh, presets I was just sort of going through here. So you can sort of pick where, what's your starting point? What do you want out of this song? Wow. Modern dynamics, richness and depth. So they give you these, uh, good starting points, and then you can you can sort of go from there. So uh, so ozone is wonderful if you want to do your own production and your own mastering. Um, what I what I'm going to do this week is I'll I'll, I'll actually uh, take one of these songs, and I'll do a video, and master it with different settings. So you can hear the difference between a pre-mastered and a post-mastered song with various um, uh, various settings, yeah, and just to get your ears sort of used to uh, understanding what mastering is. So uh, that uh, I think that's really the most important last chapter that we need to cover in the book. There is a, a section on MIDI. I think most of us are fairly comfortable with MIDI, but I will go over that next week with you just to show you some of the cool tricks that you can use with MIDI. And um, uh, the rest of the course is really finishing off your, uh, your mix projects and your, your original recording projects. I'll also be working on a final review guide uh, I'll, I'm going to have to change, of course, the uh, final exam 
format since it's got to be online. Um, I tend to not count the exams very high percentage wise anyway, and it's sort of a way of me checking that you've, you've read the chapters and under, understand some basic concepts. So that, that'll be pretty low impact. Okay, um, so do you guys have any concerns about how to proceed, what you're gonna do, where to go from here? Just wondering, um, so what is the other project, the, like the final project then that we have to do? Well, okay, so there, the, the two, there are two recording projects and two mixed projects. The, uh, uh, the, the second recording project, I said minimum of four channels. The first recording project was maximum four channels of audio. So, uh, you know, your song, uh, it sort of meets both, <laughs> uh, both of those requirements. So if you just do one more uh, recording that has, oh, no, wait, you did, you did the first recording project already. So you've, you've actually met both, both of those requirements. So you're, you're done with the recording part. You just have to do the two mixes. Okay. And then what are we mixing? Uh, if you go to the shared Google Drive for this course, there are two logic projects that are loaded there. And I just call it Mix Project 1 and Mix Project 2. Let one of them was the country music one, yes, right? Yes, yeah, that one, okay, so yeah, that was called number two. And the other was the, uh, the, the two singers with guitars. That was project one. Um, okay, so I think I did all of them then. Did you do all of those? Okay. I think so. Okay, yeah, and uh, boy, you're in, you're in good shape then. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll check that out for you, Christy, to make sure I've got them all submitted and uh, we do want to listen to all of them, make sure everyone gets an opportunity to hear your take on things. So, yeah, excellent. Yeah, anything else? Cool. Well, um, I will post this uh, video for the, the four who didn't see it and get in contact with them, make sure everything's good with them. And we'll just meet again next Monday so have a good and safe week, guys. Cool. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thanks. See you later. Later.